Amen. Thank you to the choir for the good singing this morning, and thanks to the ensemble for the wonderful words of life. Let's take our Bibles and turn to some of those wonderful words of life this morning, and we'll find our text today in the book of Galatians and chapter number 2. The book of Galatians and chapter number 2. Thank you, Troy. Appreciate that. You know, this morning, if you didn't make it for Sunday school, you really missed a great expository message on the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, how Brother Barry incorporated not only the gospel records of the crucifixion, but he also incorporated very nicely the prophetic, prophetic scriptures from Psalms, Isaiah, and other places about this uh, most important event in human history. Everything centers on the cross. It is the central focal point of all of recorded time. When we read in the Old Testament, beginning in the book of Genesis, and reading all the way through the book of Malachi, we see time and again the plan of salvation, of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work upon the cross. We don't hear words like cross and salvation necessarily in the Old Testament, but we see Jesus in all 39 books of the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. We see Him in type and in shadow in all of those books, and all of those pictures typify what the Lord Jesus Christ was coming to do for us on the cross. And so the Old Testament saints, they put their faith in the Christ to come. They believed God. And, and, and every Old Testament saint who died and went into the paradise of God upon their death got there the same way that Abraham did. They believed God and it was counted unto them as righteousness or for righteousness. Now, Jesus came and He died upon that cross. <coughs> and now for these past 2,000 years, and ever how much longer we have in this dispensation of time called the day of grace or the church age, <coughs> we get saved the very same way. But instead of us looking forward to Christ's coming, <coughs> we look back to see what Christ came and what He did, and we put faith, in what He did for us on the cross of Calvary. And so just like Abraham, we believe God. We believe His Word. And we believe what He done for us on the cross <coughs> is sufficient to forgive us of our sins. And that belief in God has been counted to us for righteousness. And the Bible, as Brother Barry brought out in Sunday school this morning, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he, for he, he, uh, God, made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to become sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now that's good enough message to go home on right there. That's what we need to hear, that's what we need to believe, that's what we need to know personally in order to go to heaven someday. We need to believe that not only did Jesus Christ die on that cross, uh, the Bible says the devils believe and they tremble, but they're not saved. But we need to believe that He died for us as individuals and uh, that He would have done that for us, if we were the only sinner that ever lived, Jesus would have come and done the same thing. That's the great love of God. And so here in the book of Galatians, in the second chapter, I, I want to talk about the crucifixion today as well. But I'm going to look at it from a little bit different standpoint here. We're going to look at it this morning from the standpoint of the Apostle Paul. You know, Paul had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ with all of his heart and he was saved and 
God called him to be the missionary to the Gentiles, the apostle to the Gentiles. And Paul, everywhere he went, he gave it everything he had. He told them the truth. He told them the truth about the, uh, the, the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. He, he taught them that there was only one way to be saved. He taught them that we're not saved by keeping the law. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But you know, these poor churches and, and, and the letter to the Galatians is not just to one church. If you'll read chapter 1 verse 1 in the introduction, you'll find that Paul addresses this letter to the churches, plural, uh, the churches of Galatia. You see, in that region of the world, something bad had happened. Paul had established these works on the gospel message that Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. He was buried and rose again the third day and that if you'll believe that by faith thou shalt be saved and you're saved forever and the transaction is done. When Paul finishes his work, he goes on to another work. And then there are Jews, certain Jews, who slipped, slipped back into the churches of Galatia and began to infiltrate them with lies. And it confused the people. It confused those young Galatian believers. And they really didn't know what was right. Well, Paul got word of that. And so, so Paul wrote him this letter. And uh, he was full of compassion uh, he was full of uh, sympathy for their situation. But if you read this letter carefully, uh, you can tell that Paul is basically telling them, now look, I founded you correctly. You were, you were founded and grounded in the correct gospel, in the truth. And now you've let these people slip in here and try to give you another gospel, which is not another. There's not another gospel. And he just flat out tells them in chapter 1, he says, if, if me or one of my workers or even an angel from heaven were to come and give you any other gospel than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. The Greek word there is anathema. Let him be cut off and go to hell. That's, what, that's how... That's how strong Paul was standing on the cross of Calvary and on the crucifixion and that Jesus' death paid it all. Amen. His blood paid for every sin. So as we come to chapter number 2, I want to read verses 19, 20, and 21 for a, for a context, but our text that we'll examine this morning is verse number 20. The Bible says in Galatians 2.19, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now you can see here in these three verses what Paul is having to deal with. He's dealing with these Judaizers who have come in and have confused these Galatian believers in, in two areas. Number one, uh, one is in the area of salvation. They, they were telling them that it's not enough. Uh, you, 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 you can't just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. You, you've got to be under the law. And uh, Paul said here, he said in verse 19, For I, through the law, am dead. He said, hey, well, there's no need in putting faith in the law. There's no salvation in the law. He says, that I might live 
unto God. Then the other lie that they were telling them, not only did they have to believe the law or, 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 or keep the law in order to be saved, they dealt with assurance and they lied to them and told them that you have to keep the law in order to stay saved. And let me tell you, there are a lot of denominations out in our world today that still practice that. That you have to work at it in order to stay saved. And Paul said in verse 21, he said, I, I don't frustrate the grace of God. You're, you're frustrating the grace of God. He said, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. In other words, he died for nothing. Why did Jesus have to go to that cross and suffer like he did in order uh, for you to be saved if all you had to do to be saved was to keep the law. So he said, I, I'm not going to tell you this again. He said, this is the way it is. This is the truth. And so in verse number 20 of our, of our text this morning, verse number 20, we see the heart. We really see the heart of our Christian life. Verse number 20 is Paul's confession of the power of the cross in his own life. You see, the cross stood between Paul and his past. And the cross secured Paul and his future. And the same is true for you and for me. His self-life. You, you recall when he spoke to the Philippians, he he talked about there in Philippians how uh, about all the things that he had, his education, his, his uh, uh, Phariseeship, and all of those things that, that he had that could be put on a resume. He said, I counted all those things as dung or as garbage that I may know him, that I may know Christ. And so we see that his self-life was nailed to the cross with Jesus. And he said, I no longer have to uh, participate in vain efforts to keep the law in order to be saved. He said, I'm saved, I'm safe, and I'm secure, not of myself, but by the indwelling and overflowing life of Jesus Christ in me. I used to tell the young people that Galatians 2.20 was the Christian's pledge of allegiance to Christ. We, we know the pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We know that pledge. We learned it when we were but mere children in elementary school. My friend, we need to stand up as Christians today in the midst of a world that is just being overrun by false religion and liberal religion that's, that's taking over the world because it's attracting the flesh and let the world hear us stand up and place our hand over our blood-bought heart and say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This morning I want to bring a message I entitled, Yet Not I, But Christ. You see, Paul tells them about the importance of the cross once again in verse number 20. And Paul, no doubt, was reminded of the words of the Lord in John chapter 4 and verse number 14 as Jesus spoke with the Samaritan woman by Jacob's well. And when he told her, But whosoever shall drink of the water that I shall give shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. What Paul is talking about here is what John recorded for us in the 19th chapter of his gospel, beginning in the 16th verse. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. 
And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him. One on one either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. This morning I want us to consider for just a moment what Jesus did for us on that cross. And what that cross and the crucifixion of Jesus on that cross should mean to you and to me. I want you to notice first of all as we break down verse number 20 here for just a moment. Let's examine first of all our position in Christ. What is your position in Christ today? Do you know Him? Have you met Him personally? You know, we were just uh, up visiting Amanda and her family, and on Tuesday we rode into the city, into Washington, D.C., and went to see a couple of things. And uh, while we were there, uh, I got to see the White House. That's not the first time I've seen it, uh, but I've only ever just seen it from a distance, and I, that's the way I saw it today. But it is... It's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful building and uh, sitting in the heart of our nation's capital. And you know something, I know who sits in the Oval Office of that White House. I know. I know what his name is. I know what his wife's name is. I know what his children's names are. I know that he lost a child. I know a lot of things about our president, but I don't know him. I've never met him. I've never seen him in person. I've never shook his hand. I've never spoke a word to him. And you see, therein is the difference between religion and redemption. A lot of people know about Jesus. They know that he was born in Bethlehem. They, knew, they know that he grew up in Nazareth, the son of a carpenter. They know he was a great preacher and a great prophet. And they know that one day... Uh, that he healed people of their blindness and their, uh, their dumbness of their tongue, the deafness of their ears, uh, the, the lameness of their limbs. He, he brought healing unto them. And, and they know that one day he made a bunch of them Jews mad at him. And they, they made, he made them so mad that they sent him to the Romans and they killed him. And that's their extent of their knowledge of Jesus. Well, that's no more going to get me to get you to heaven than me knowing about who the president is is going to get me in to a state dinner. Amen? You have to know him. And so Paul is trying to explain here. He says, we, we have a position. Now, before I knew Christ, he said, my position was in the past. I was lost. I was a Pharisee. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was greatly educated, he could have said. I come from a great family, he could have said. And I had multiple talents and abilities. But he said, all of that I counted as garbage so that I could know him. You see, the cross will change your position. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. In that, he tells of his past position. You see, I was crucified when Jesus was crucified. And that crucifixion was a one time for all time experience. I was crucified. And I stand today crucified with Christ. Why does the cross change our position? What are we nailing to the cross? Jesus' literal body was nailed to the cross. But what are we nailing to the cross? What does Paul mean when he says, I'm crucified with Christ? I've never bore a heavy cross on my back. 
I've never laid, laid down and let anybody nail nails into my hands and my feet and raise me up to hang there and die. I've never experienced what Jesus experienced. How could I say? And Paul the same way. How could Paul say, I am crucified with Christ? Because here's the change. You see, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a sinner. You're the enemy of God. And your sins are your death sentence. See, Jesus, as Barry taught this morning, Jesus had done nothing wrong. He was sinlessly perfect, didn't even have a sin nature. Yet they nailed him to a cross as a criminal. What was he being nailed there for? For your sin and for mine and for the sins of the whole world. So Paul included himself in that. And he said when Christ was nailed to that cross, he said he was dying there for me too. And so in order for me to know him, I'm willing to crucify my old man of sin and let this old man of sin die and let him save me and resurrect me to a new man that will follow him. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 says, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So the cross changes our position. We, we learn of our past life. We learn what we crucified to that cross. Romans chapter 6 told us it was the old man of sin. Galatians chapter 5, on over in the 5th chapter, verse 24, Paul told those Galatians, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. Now Jesus died once and for all. What Jesus did on the cross paid for sin for all time. But we must die daily. We don't get saved every day. That's not what I'm talking about. But we must practice to crucify that flesh every day that we may not serve sin, but that we may follow Christ. So he shows us our past position. I am crucified with Christ. And he explains what was crucified our old man of sin. But then he tells us about our present position. Nevertheless, I live. What a paradox. We have a paradox here. We're dead in our trespasses, but now we're alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. How did that happen? It happened by faith. It happened by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Crucifixion results in death every time. They'd leave you hanging there until you did die. Nobody, I don't know of one recorded instance where they said, all right, that's enough, pulled out the nails and they jumped down and went on about their life. I, I never read one account of that. The Romans were 100% effective in their execution method of crucifixion. But because I was willing as a sinner to come to the crucified one, the Lord Jesus, and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me on that cross. I believe you shed your blood to pay for my sin. And I am willing, I am willing because you love me to crucify my old man of sin and leave that life of sin and repent from that life of sin and turn to you, Lord Jesus, and let your blood wash me and forgive me of my sins that I may become a new creature in Christ and live for you. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. 
Jesus was talking to Martha in the Gospel of John, chapter number 11, when Lazarus had died. And you remember, she told him, she said, if you'd have been here, our brother wouldn't have died. And he said, uh, he said your brother will live again. And she said, I know he'll live again in the resurrection. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection. You're looking at him. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. It's not talking about the flesh. It's talking about the spirit. So we see the cross changes our position from an old man of sin who is willing to come to Christ and crucify that flesh and and to repent and turn from that sin life and follow him. He said, I am crucified, nevertheless, I live. The position the cross puts us in. But secondly, let's look at the power of Christ on that cross or the result of it. He says, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So Paul here is going to go from telling these Galatians who have been lied to about the plan of salvation by these Jews and been lied to about the assurance of their salvation by these Jews. And he tells them, now listen, he says, listen up, Galatians. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You got to understand something. Salvation is not something that you keep. Salvation is not anything that you earned. Salvation was not anything that you were worthy of. Salvation is not something you did anything to get. It was a free gift offered to you by the Lord Jesus Christ and all you have to do to receive it is to believe on Him and place your faith and trust in Him. And so he says, listen, he said, this crowd over here is telling you that if you receive Christ, you got to believe him, but you got to keep the law. He said, I've already showed you that if Christ, if the law is salvation, then Christ died for nothing. But he said, now I want you to understand that it's not me that keeps me alive, but it's Christ in me that keeps me alive. And so he said, I'm safe, I'm secure forevermore not because I keep the law, not even trying to keep the law. He said, but I'm safe and secure because Christ now lives in me. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So he talks about the power of Christ. The Bible tells us that Christ had power to lay his life down. That's substitution. We're going to talk more about that tonight. But not only did he have power to lay his life down, but he had power to take it back up again. Not only did Christ possess the power of substitution, but he also possessed the power of resurrection. John put it like this in John 10, 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So we put our faith and our trust in a power named the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had the power, he had the power and the authority to die for me in my place. Then he had the power and authority to dismiss his spirit when he was good and ready and not one second before. And then he has the power to resurrect out of that grave three days later and lives forevermore. Now he extends that power to us. And he gives us that opportunity to take part of that free gift of salvation and become the children of God. John put it like this in John 1, 12. He said, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name. Power to lay it down. Power to take it up. Now he has power to extend that free gift to you. Do you want it? Amen? That's what he's asking those Galatian people. Do you want it? He's offered it to you free of charge. He extends the power to become sons. So he not only possesses the power of substitution and the power of resurrection, he possesses the power of salvation. 
You can be saved if you want to be saved. No one will ever shake their bony finger in God's face and say, I didn't know you didn't give me a chance. But then as we progress on, the Bible tells us that the Lord, He indwells His power uh, within us. Not only did He die for us and be resurrected for us and, and offer salvation to us, but His power indwells in us for a ministry to live for Him. Acts 1.8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. And so He gives us power in order to be a ministry. But then he also gives us the power. He possesses the power of mediation. He is our intercessor. Paul told Timothy that there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. But he also tells us in the book of Romans, chapter number 8, Verses 32 to 34, he, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Paul is trying to tell these Galatian believers that Christ changes your position at the cross. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And then he talks about the power of Christ. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. It was Christ who died in my place. It was Christ who was buried. It was Christ who was resurrected under newness of life. It is Christ that indwells me with His power. It is Christ uh, who uh, intercedes for me on my behalf. And then in the rest of the verse, the last part of the verse, he talks about the proven reliability of Christ. Our position in Christ, the power of Christ, and the proven reliability of Christ. He says, in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's absolutely reliable. You can trust your life to him. You can trust your day-to-day -day life to him. You can trust your eternal life to him. You know why you can do that? Because the book of Colossians in chapter number 2, verses 1, 2, and 3 teaches us that Christ is the master of all wisdom and knowledge. That's what the third verse tells us. That he, he possesses all wisdom and knowledge. I can take anything to him and he'll lead me and he'll guide me in the right direction. You see, I seek daily the God of all knowledge that I may daily live my life by faith in Him. Paul says, church, he says, you ain't going to make it on your own intelligence. You're not going to make it on your own way. You, you have been saved by God Himself incarnate in flesh. He gave His life for you. He offers you eternal salvation. Nowhere will you find that He requires you to do or keep anything. He does all the keeping. He has the keeping power. And He says you can trust Him day by day, not by going and examining the law, taste not, touch not, do this, don't do that. He said you just need to come to the Master of all wisdom and knowledge and He'll show you what to do. And then he said that not only was the, he's the master of all wisdom and knowledge, but he's the master of all faithfulness and compassion. When we're in need of compassion, when we're needing to be able to count on somebody who will never let us down, 
Psalms 86, 15 reminds us, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. And you know, the Bible tells us over in the book of Hebrews that He is the master of all sacrificial giving. You see, the Lord Jesus taught me how He sacrificed for me so that I'll be able to sacrifice for Him. He said over here in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that He should offer Himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so when Paul was writing to the church at Rome, he said in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul tells these Galatian believers, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, when Paul was finishing out that letter to the Galatians, he said, From henceforth, let no man trouble me. He said, I'm not going to go over this again. Jesus died for all. And all that come to him will he bring into the family. He will save and he will keep. Yet not I, but Christ. That's the meaning of the cross. That's what he did. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your precious word this morning. Thank you for the great truth that we hear time and time again. How that you died for us in our place. Saved us, that we may be saved forever. All because of what you did for us on the cross. I pray for this congregation. If there be anyone here that doesn't know Jesus, I pray that they'll come this morning as we sing a number of invitation and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that they may be saved. And I pray this morning for someone here that's been battling with the assurance of their salvation. I pray they'd come this morning and get that thing sure because the Bible tells us it is a sure thing. Have you will and way now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.